look at Joseph's dreams in Genesis chapter 37. Let's look at Joseph. In verse 3, the Bible calls him Israel in the New King James Version. But we also know him as Jacob. Loved his son Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. So what do you do? He made him this phenomenal jacket with a whole bunch of colors on it. But then when his brothers saw that his father loved him more than all his other brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to them. Now Joseph had a dream and told his brothers. They hated him even more. Duh, Joseph. So he said to him, please hear this dream which I dreamed. He went ahead and told him, verse 7, they did all these, God did all these things in my life and he started promoting me and everything looked really good. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream. He told it to his brothers again. Someone said, yo, Joe. He said, I dreamed another dream. This time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told this to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to earth before you? And his brothers envied him because his father kept the matter in mind. It stayed on Jacob's mind. stayed on Israel's mind. Then his brothers went to feed the flock. And Israel said to Joseph, are your brothers not feeding the flock where they're supposed to be feeding the flock? Verse 13, 14 is, is instrumental. Then he said to him, please go see if your brothers are well. They're supposed to be doing something specific. They're supposed to be feeding the flocks and bring the word back to me. Let me know, Joseph if they're where they're supposed to be at. Verse, verse 15 says this. Now a certain man, someone said, hmm, who's this person? Where'd you come from? Now a certain man found him, and there he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, what are you seeking? Joseph's like, well, well, well on my agenda today, my father told me to find my brothers and make sure that they're taking care of the flock. My priority, my priority today is make sure my brothers are doing what they're supposed to be doing. My schedule today involves me making sure my brothers are doing what they're supposed to be doing. My father, Jacob Israel, sent me on priority, sent me on schedule, sent me on agenda, sent me on assignment. Verse 16. So he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they're feeding their flocks. In verse 18, and then I'll have you rest your knees and your feet. Now when they saw him afar off, oh, even before he came near, they conspired against him to kill him. You may have your seats. They planned to kill Joseph because he had a dream. They planned to kill Joseph because of his words. They plotted and planned against him. You were supposed to stay standing, but I looked at an elder. She looked at me so faithfully and said, Boy, let me sit down. She didn't say that, but I heard it in my head. That's the creative side of me. So I said, Elvin Peg, yeah, let me let you sit down. So I'm imagining y'all standing and declare God's word at the same time. Let's look at another, another verse. Media is doing a good job. They're not supposed to tell you my title yet. 1 Samuel 16, 1 through verse 13. So the concept of Joseph is our foundational focus this morning. And now we're going to look at the concept of David. The Lord said to Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, How long will you mourn for Saul? Your schedule involves you mourning for Saul. You're prioritizing mourning, mourning for Saul. Every day on your agenda, you're mourning for Saul. Since I have rejected him as king over Israel, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. Perfect. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Verse 10, let's drop down to verse 10. Jesse had seven sons passed before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all your sons? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said to him, we will not sit down until he arrives. Verse 12. So he sent for him and brought him. Wait, hold on, back up. Is these all your sons, he asked Jesse. He said, no, there's one more. There's the youngest. His agenda, his schedule, and his priorities every day involve him Tending the sheep. What does he do? Every day he does what? 
He does it every day. He's tending the sheep. That's part of what he does. It's part of his path. It's part of his route. It's part of his life. It doesn't look like nothing else is coming. Right now, what he does every day is tend sheep. So everything he's trying to, everything he wants to do every day is just become a better sheep tender. He can't imagine anything else because that's his parameters. I'm going somewhere. So he sent for him. They brought him. He was glowing with health and had fine appearance. Every lady in here say he was fine. Come on, ladies, have a little fun this morning. Say David was fine. Oh, I got it. Say David was handsome. Y'all feel a little better in church saying that, huh? So he sent this, so he sent for his handsome young son to meet the prophet. He's glowing with health and fine appearance, handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. I want to talk to you from the subject. What's my subject? <laughs> the purpose plot. I want to talk to you from the subject, the purpose plot. Joseph had a job, a role. Everything changed when he had a dream. David had a job and a role. Everything changed when he got anointed. Both of these boys could not imagine doing anything else outside of their parameters. But God came into their life with a purpose plot. God came into David's life and now anointed him to be king. How random is that? I'm minding my own business, working insurance. Don't see myself starting a business. My dad did insurance. My uncles do insurance. I'm talking hypothetically. I don't do insurance. And now God gives me this thought of starting a business in Columbia, South Carolina, a purpose plot. Many of us, we miss the purpose plot because we're loyal to our agenda. We love our schedule. It's comfortable to stay focused on what you've always done. We love our career so much that God can't interrupt it. We love our job so much that God can't throw a curveball. And today the Lord instructed me on this morning to talk to you from the subject, the purpose plot. The proof that you're in the will of God is found in the evil day, not the good day. The fact that bad things tried to make you and take you out and you're still here. The fact of the matter is, I want you to think about how many times you miss death harm's way. Give it a try. It's hard to imagine all the times because actually you wasn't looking at the car that almost hit you. You notice the car almost hit you. Don't, the times you can count that you missed death, you actually reacted and realized that could have been me. The time you were frustrated on traffic, that traffic that you almost cussed. Holy Spirit, for real. The traffic that some of you all actually cussed. <laughs> Later on, you find out that the 18-wheeler filled with gasoline exploded right where you were supposed to be. But that was the worst day ever because you were late to work. You had hair problems, couldn't drink the coffee you wanted to. And now you realize that the blessing of the Lord doesn't show up on the good day, shows up on the evil day. Shows up on the day where you're too loyal to your schedule to see that God's actually keeping you. The fact of the matter is, I want you to think about how many times you missed death or harm's way. You wasn't intentional. You didn't plan your escape. It just happened right in that moment, you happen to leave when you needed to leave. You happen to get stuck in traffic when you needed to be stuck in traffic. You happen to buy that and you really wanted to buy that. But then all of a sudden you didn't buy that because you couldn't afford that. And now you look back and, and you're like, God, I'm so glad I couldn't afford that because it wasn't worth the value I thought it was. You happen, not, you happen to not marry them. Thank God you didn't marry them. They left you. But aren't you so glad they left you? It's the purpose plot. We want the will of God to come with wishes, but the will of God comes with wielding. It's the purpose plot. It's the twist of your life. It's the thought I was going this way, but how am I now going this way? Some of you are in a career. You're in ministry. You're a mother. You're a father. You're married to a queen. You're married to a king. And if you really think about it, you could not have even planned the grace you're walking in right now. It actually happened because of the twist. It actually happened because of the inconvenience, and then you met her. 
You dropped your books like Spider-Man and he came out of nowhere. Hey. <laughs> Lord, I, I promised when I prepared this sermon, I thought it was going to be a deep Holy Ghost sermon. Y'all pulling out the goofy side of me this morning. It's the purpose plot. It's the unexpected involvement of God that you think is the devil. When those pipes burst in my house, I thought it was the devil. But it was a setup for my whole house to be remodeled. Amen. It was the purpose plot. When they didn't have no room in that hospital and you found out later that there's a lot of malpractice in that hospital, it was the purpose plot. Amen. You were so frustrated. Everything God needed for Joseph and his purpose was found in the loneliness of his pit. Without his brothers hating on him, he would not have met Pharaoh. It's the twist. It's the involvement of other things in your life that you want to control, but you can't control. It's the person that bothers you, or why can't they just not like me? And they're not going to like you. They're a sign to push you away from being liked so that you learn to do stuff without being light. So God keeps things and people and stuff in your life that you want to be comfortable because he does not want you comfortable there. And if all these things in your life were comfortable, you would not find purpose. So God sends a plot. And we're going to look at this. He sends things in your life that keep you on edge. You thought you were going that way, but now you went that way. A lot of you all are in business at our church simply because you realized it was time to leave your job. You realized there was nowhere to go. And you actually had that business in your heart for multiple years. You didn't launch out and do it. So God allowed your comfort to get shooken up. Woo. He allowed things to shift and change in your life so that you wouldn't be so comfortable with average. Because yesterday, yesterday's success in God can become average in your tomorrow when God moves up and God moves. It's that part of, the, of your life that God is allowed to go AWOL in. It's the part of your life that doesn't match your vision board. It's the irritating, inconvenience part of your soul that doesn't match up with what you said. God, you said. You said I would be able, you showed me, you told me, you said it'll be this way. It's the purpose plot. It's the part of God that throws you curveballs and fastballs and slow balls. See, I thought church faithfulness was a straight line. And I thought all I had to do was be consistent on that straight line of faithfulness. But then the Lord showed me that faithfulness will become a roller coaster. And now it's not about the length of the ride. It's about how faithful I am in uncertainty. It's the purpose plot. That God's watching me as I go down and go up and twist and turn and ah, ah, ah. <laughs> bills, baby, wife, husband, mortgage, house, roof, leak, pipes, burst, <laughs> divorce, grief, death, life. But you're still preaching, though. You're still serving. You're still married. You're still faith. Faithfulness is not a straight line. That would be easy. Faithfulness is not faithfulness unless uncertainty is closer than what you see. Not knowing the knowledge of every incremental detail lodged in my experience. But what makes a roller coaster exciting is the uncertainty. It's built within the ride. The experience is the bonus of going on to a roller coaster that makes no sense. It's about the experience that's connected to the ride. It's the lack of knowledge of what comes next that makes a ride at an amusement park worth riding. But until you step into your life and accept the fact that the will of God comes with plots and twists, you'll never find God in calamity. And you will always have shallow faith and withdraw yourself from being used in deep waters. You have to stay faithful during life's twist. So let's drop down to 1 Samuel chapter 16, and we're going to look at what God said to Samuel. He told him to take the anointing and anoint somebody else. Samuel 
had a twist in his prophetic assignment because he was used to staying faithful and loyal to Saul, but God's spirit then left Saul and found another. Now, here's the weird part. This is the first time Samuel doesn't know the details of what's next. Usually the prophet knows all the time what's next. God runs up on Samuel and says, I chose another king for myself. The first king was chosen by Israel. The second king, David, was chosen by God. God keeps the second king hidden. Samuel, for the first time in his whole prophetic career, a MVP of prophesying, he has no idea who the next king is. So now is the plot twist for his career. Meanwhile, David's over here tending the sheep, doesn't even know that his life's about to twist. All he thought he was called to do was tend the sheep. He was used to being looked over, used to being looked down on. Matter of fact, he actually stopped whining about it. He just said, hey, I'll just do what I'm supposed to do. This is what I'm supposed to do. My brothers go to war. They do all this other cool stuff. I'm the guy that everybody forgets about. So the guy that everybody forgets about, God finds. The guy that everybody forgets about, God finds. The woman that everybody forgot about, God finds. Because of the purpose plot. And God said, I found myself a king. Let me change it so you can see yourself in the word. God said, I found myself a millionaire. God said, I found myself a business owner. God said, I found myself an author. God said, I found myself a musician from Columbia. So God, see, you don't know that God can find you in your career. If God can find David in his low season, what makes you think you need your supervisor's cosign? <laughs> Nobody cosigned for David. It was the plot twist. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and then a twist happens. The evil spirit now torments him. What messes me about, up about this, elders, is the evil, evil spirit did not come from the devil. The evil spirit came from God. God can send evil spirits? That's why God tells you to pray for your enemies. He said, listen, homie, you don't got to do evil. I can send an evil spirit. <laughs> you don't got to do them harm. I can back up off of hate, praying, get back up off of being mean Christians, back up off of being mean to your enemies, and pray for them. Pray a blessing on them. Because when I send my evil spirit, nothing can get in the way. It's the plot twist. So David came to Saul and entered his service. All these things start happening. And for the first time ever in David's consistent lifestyle of tending sheep, Rashawn, for the first time, David's no longer doing what he usually does. Now he finds himself killing bears and killing lions. He finds himself in a palace. He finds himself wearing cologne and wearing Versace cologne that don't belong to him. I think I'm believing God for some, I'm joking. But like, he finds himself wearing new shoes. You, you, you get what I'm saying? His whole life changed, and one would say it was random, but it was totally on purpose. It wasn't by his intentionality, it was by God's intentionality. You're so good at making your decisions. You're so good at choosing the job that's best for you and your family. You're so good. You don't understand that God can use a twist, a twist in the economy. He can use a twist in grandma's health to get you to wake up in purpose. He can use a twist in your parents' health to make you stop being immature. And we don't understand how God works. When God wants to wake up a king in you, he will send a confused prophet to your town. Samuel was not focused. He was confused and obedient. God will send a leader who does not, I don't know, but I think you can. I don't know if you can speak, but I think you can speak. So let me give you the mic because I think there's something in you that's called to speak. I'm confused. I don't really know how to explain myself, but I see something inside of you. So that's why you got to learn how to follow leadership that's anointed. Because we don't know all the details. We just feel the little thing in us that tells us there's something about you that's different. All my Aunt Bertha said was the purpose plot to my father. You know, you're called, you're anointed. She didn't say you'll be in South Carolina. She didn't say you'll have multiple campuses to my father. All she knew was a glass, see through a glass darkly. Stop trying to make everybody sound like a manual, a guideline. God's not going to give you a workbook with your purpose. He gives you broken people to prophesy into your life and tell you, I think you got something about your voice. I see somebody doing something in your, you want everybody to be so nice and nice and clean and perfect and you're not nice and clean and perfect so you can't even hear the word of God from anybody. God is tired of our straight lines. He's moving through pandemics. He's moving through economies. He's moving through presidents. 
the ones you don't like. That's not God. <laughs> Many things are happening right now. You have a young man under the stewardship of Saul. You have all these things happen. And see, here's the thing that we must understand. For everybody who wants your, ba your, babies, the ba your baby to get their hands laid, I just, if I could just get my teenager, if I could just get my husband, get him laid, his hands laid on by the pastor, if I could just make sure my wife, my, someone need to lay hands on my wife, if I could just get somebody to lay hands on me, my life would be better. Let me tell you something about the anointing. The anointing is not reactive, it's proactive. Once you get anointed, trouble shows up after. The anointing does not eliminate you out of trouble, it brings it to you. I need y'all, I need us to catch this. The anointing doesn't make your life better. It, do you understand where the even theology, it comes, it comes from the shepherd would put oil on the sheep so that when it got in trouble, the oil would make the flies stay out the ears and the oil on the sheep would make the sheep slip through stuff like vineyards and thorns. It wasn't for the good day, the anointing was for the evil day. It's the plot twist. I need you to understand the reason why you are called and the reason why God can trust you. I'm about to switch, right? The reason why I, you are called and the reason why God can trust you. Come on, let's go. We'll do this. Keep it. I'll cut it off. The reason why you are called and the reason why God can trust you is not because of how you perform so good when things were well. It was because of how good you perform when things were bad. See, you thought your faithfulness was contingent upon how you acted on your good day. Your faithfulness was contingent on how you act when you found out that person died. When you found out that person left you. When you found out that person lied on you and cheated on you and turned on you. I need you to understand the anointing comes with problems, not without it. The anointing is the precursor of problems. Now, let's look at this scripture of the bears and the lions. Now, David, for the first time ever, as he's taking care of sheep, he finds himself having to fight off bears and lions. I never had this problem. But after this horn with oil came into my life, now bears showing up? Now lions showing up? What's going on? The purpose plot showing up, David. The purpose plot is starting to happen in your life. You're on the same job, but now new problems are showing up. See, you thought the anointing was going to get you off your job. The anointing is going to cause you to be more revealed in your job. First the blade, you right? So the first thing that happens to prove that he's called to be king is the bear and lion must get killed by one. Before you kill a person with the anointing to be king, it's time for you to kill a beast in your life. It's time for you to kill a lion. Now there's no crowd around when David kills the bear and the lion because the first thing you should do when you're anointed is not look for a stage. You should look for a closet. A prayer closet. See, if you're called to ministry, show up for intercessory prayer. If you're called, show up to serve in obscurity. The first thing you should do when you're anointed is not look for Goliath. You should try to find a small bear. Can you take care of the bears in the youth ministry? Can you take care of the lions in the, in the epic ministry first? I know you're called to preach and you want them to see, but can you take care of the bears in VBS and serve ice cream? Anointed. Anointed but serving ice cream to the kids anointing but being a garbage man you're called to entrepreneurship you know you'll be a millionaire but right now you got to take care of working for the county it is what it is anointed people are not moved by vocation they trust that God has the ability to twist their life turn their life and sit them up into the right situation to get things elevated in their life. They don't do the elevation. They don't do the plotting and the chess and the decision making and the politics. True anointed people just sit in their life and their life creates opportunity for itself. So David asked a question, elders. He asked a question in 1 Samuel chapter 17. He's anointed and then here comes another plot twist. For the first time ever, his dad asked him to take his lunch to his brothers. So he takes his lunch. There's another twist. He takes his lunch to his brothers. As he goes to take his lunch to his brothers, he's, he's still dependable. He leaves the sheep with a caretaker. And verse 30, he's at the battlefield. And he turned, to ask, he turned and asked people. He said, what would happen if someone kills this big giant who's disrespecting our people? What would happen if someone, and they said, well, this is what will happen. The king will set you up real good, no taxes. You can marry his daughter, and you have a whole royal experience. And David said, what? Are you sure? And then he said, and then his brother. Now, Elah's oldest brother heard what he said to the man. 
In verse 28, 1 Samuel 17 and 28. Anger burned against David, and he said, why have you come down here? With whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption, your overconfidence, and the evil in your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. Actually, brother, I'm here on a purpose plot. I was actually supposed to be tending the sheep, but your father, my daddy, asked me to bring y'all some food. That's the only reason why I'm here. And you mad because I'm asking questions? I was even planning to be here. I'm in obedience. But David said, what have I done now? It's just a harmless question. No, it's not. Because anointed people, when they ask questions, they become the answer. You're so scared to be in environments where no one knows what to do. You're tired of confusion. I need everything organized in my life. You are the organizing. You're the one that's, I'm tired of everybody having these issues. They always come to my life. I hate working them. You are the anointing things, the burden, removing, yoke, destroying power of God. And you mad because that coworker has burdens and yokes? And they work with you? You ask for the anointing. If you wanted re a regular, smuggler life, stop praying. Stop praying, stop seeking God. And God will say, hey, you can have a straight line as best you can. But if you love the Lord, there's a lot of plots, a lot of twists that's going to show up in your life. You'll be at the gym working out, and God will deal with your heart about ministering to somebody. And you're just trying to have your workout, and God will keep bothering you. Now get off that squat machine and go over there and tell them about Jesus. Man, God, I just want some me time. There is no me time when you're anointed. <laughs> David turned away from Eli. Verse 30, David said, what have I done now? The, what really blessed me is this. I love how the purpose plot anoints David to turn away from someone who's older than him that he should be able to depend on. In verse 30, it says, then David turned away from Eli to someone else. I'm not going to allow someone who's familiar with me keep me from asking the questions that I need to ask. If you're family and you won't help me, I'll ask somebody else to help me. I'm not moved by my older brother thinking I'm little. I'm not moved by my older brother thinking I'm nothing. I know you know me all your life, but I'm not moved by you. I'll ask somebody else the purpose question. So you ask somebody else the question, and they gave them the same answer. Here's the point. A whole bunch of problems start to happen. I just gave you evidence. A whole bunch of problems start to happen after David gets anointed by Samuel. The oil that was in Samuel's horn did not eliminate the problems. It brought them to him. So the Lord said to Samuel, how long you will mourn? All these things start happening. Problems, 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 problems. And I want to encourage you and comfort you on this morning. The reason why all hell is breaking loose in your life is not because you can't find heaven. You are heaven. Too much is given, much is required. If you have been going through something, you should be praising right now for the purpose that God's plotted in your life because he's activated in your life. And the reason why a bunch of problems start showing up in your life is because you're anointed for them. Problems before position, anointing before assignment. Well, I would, I would if they would just give me a chance. That's the assignment. No, be it without it. You should kill that song in the shower without being asked to sing it for it yet. You in the shower killing worship. A whole concert happening in the shower. Mom, is that you? Yeah, I need, someone needs to tell me as a baby about you. I know, but I ain't worried about that. I'm still doing my concert in the shower. Preaching to your family first. Everything that's done in the dark shows up openly. And it's the truth when you're anointed. The position is because you can solve problems. The assignment is because you're anointed. The anointing does not react to problems. The anointing proacts. It comes before. It's the precursor of the problem. Someone say plot, 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 plot. See, the purpose plot in your life is when God twists your life. It's when all things work together for your good. According to Romans 8 and 28, God promises us that there will be twists. There will be things. There will be suddenlies. There will be a whole bunch of, I didn't see that comings. But even though all these things happen in your life, Romans 8 and 28, it tells us that with great confidence that God will, who, deep, who is deeply concerned with us, causes all things to work together. And my translation says, as a plan. What? You're telling me that all these things work together, fitting into a plan? The letting up go of my job, 
the miscarriage, the divorces, the bad child, the bad marriage, the, 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 the being overlooked, not having enough money, the problems with my house, the, 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 the problems with my car, the fact that it, I'm grown and I don't feel grown because I don't have the position I need. Look, you're telling me, keep it up, please, media. You're telling me that it's all fitting into a plan? Look to your neighbor and says, everything is working out as planned. Find somebody else and say, hey, everything is working out as planned. Woo! Not your plan, but his plan. Someone say, everything is working out as planned. Now, I don't need you to think about good things when you say that. I need you to think about a list of the bad things in your life that you don't like. And I want you to look at that list in your imagination and say, everything's working out as planned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in the pit as planned. My brothers are bullying me as planned. Come on. They lying on me with Potiphar's wife as planned. Come on. Everything's working out. Goliath is taunting people and nobody else wants to fight him. It looks like no one else. They're waiting. No one can fight him, David, because you're the only one assigned to him. Everything's happening as planned. I'm usually tending sheep, but now my dad asked me to take somebody lunch. It's happening as planned. It's a purpose plot. So not only does the prophet Samuel don't know who the next king is. Let's go back. Let's go back in the text. Not only does he not know who the, the, the next king is after God rejects Saul. Now also God starts to disciple prophet Samuel and teaches him a new way of being a seer. Because some of us have gotten cocky in the realm of the spirit. And we think we know have a better knowledge of God than somebody else. So, pro, so God demotes prophet Samuel to a rookie again so that he could be humble enough to serve the next king. Because if he knows who he is before David knows who he is, ah, if Samuel knows who he is before David knows who he is, Samuel will have a respect problem with, to David. Because Samuel will be like, well, I already knew you were a king before you did. And then Samuel will accidentally think he's David's coach. So God hid ah, the next from the now so the now won't be cocky when next shows up. He needs everybody's surprise. Look to your neighbor and says, everybody has to be in shock. No one can know the details of how you showed up. That's why he allows people to doubt you. He allows uncles to hurt you. He allows family members to not help you. Because when you do show up, everybody needs to go, yo, that's my cousin. That's my brother. That's my sister. That's mama. They need to know. Ah, All they need to know is that the plot is working out as planned. I'm going to give somebody an opportunity who's been have, going through some stuff to give God praise right now. Because I feel like somebody's feeling this right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says that darkness and light is the same to God. David writes in Psalms, it says, where can I go? I can't hide from God. He said, if I go to the grave, you're there. So we would think the grave is actually too low for God. We would think that God only deserves streets of gold. God said, he says, in the grave, you're there. On the hills, you're there. In the heavens, you're there. And in the dark, you're there. He said, I can't go anywhere from God. So some of you all are looking for God to only take care of blessing you in church. God going to bless people in places and crevices and areas of darkness. That's why your son who's still smoking can still get blessed by God. Your child that's wayward can still get blessed by God. You think someone has to be totally in the will of God on your terms. A plot, definition of plot is a plan made in secret by a group of people to do something illegal or harmful. When I first saw that, I was like, God, I can't work that definition in. But secondly, it says a main event, of, uh, the main events, plural, of a play, a novel, a movie, or a similar work devised and presented by the writer as an interrelated sequence. Woo, it was in the book. Look to your neighbor say it was in the book. Say it hurt, but it was in the book. Woo, say it got on my nerves, but it was in the book. I felt like he left me, but it was in the book. Mom and dad forsake me, but it was in the book. My parents didn't believe in me, but it was in the book. 
though my mother, though my father forsake me. Now, and now I can bear witness with that scripture. See, a lot of the things we're going through, a lot of the sequence of events are part of his prophetic plot in our life so that you can bear witness with what God placed in his word so his word does not stay just a Bible to you. It becomes life to you, life breathing word in your life. So you got to look, you got to trust God's plot. God has such a way of plotting that even if it looks like you're lying, what he will speak is the truth. He, Samuel said, what, sh, Samuel said this, this is what he said, Jay. He said, I can't anoint David. He said, Saul will find out that I'm leaving. He said, this is what you're going to tell him. Tell him you're going to go sacrifice a calf at that town in Bethlehem. What? But that's not all what I was going to do. Once God tells you to lie, it's the truth. <laughs> so it wasn't part of Samuel's plans, but since God told me, it became the truth. What I'm here to tell you, God has a way of plotting, even while they're lying on you. What I'm saying is the lie on you could be the truth coming from God. So, because you won't leave anyway, so God will have them lie on you so that the sequence of events uh, can happen the way it's supposed to happen. And see, so you want to be launched in goodness. And God said, no, I'm going to make you launch with hateration because your behind won't go nowhere. You're so comfortable. You're so comfortable with them benefits. So I'm going to go ahead and make a lie happen in your life. You're going to think it's going to ruin your career. And God said, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm ruining your career so that you can find your calling. Somebody needs to give God a praise. It's the twist. It's the plot assigned to your life so that when you get so comfortable with doing you, God bumps you back into doing God. Gets you back to doing God. College students, you remember what it felt like when you had the car, your dreams, and you felt cool in that car? And it's for some reason you got in an accident and everything's okay. Why'd you change your voice? The reason why you got in an accident because you thought you were too cool in that car. You thought you bought that car yourself. And you were stunting in that car, backsliding in that car, doing stuff in that car you shouldn't be doing in that car. So God said, I'm going to take that car away so that you can come back to your knees and say, God, I repent, forgive me. And the best thing that could have happened in your life was for you to get that car taken away from you. Imagine how many people would have been pregnant or diseases you would have caught if you kept that car that you were backsliding in. So God took away that car. It's the purpose plot. It's God doing something good in the midst of something bad. Look to your neighbor and say, everything you've been going through is a setup. And everything you're in right now is a come up. Woo. Don't come apart. God is setting up variables. Don't have a come apart. God is setting up timing. Don't have a come apart. God is shaking up the season. It's not ready for you yet. But you must not give up on God's purpose for your life. can't give up on God's purpose for your life. Don't have it come apart. It's part of the sequence. Proverbs 19, 21 says, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. Three things. If you wanted to write anything down on this Sunday morning that you want to know how God operates with his twists of your life, things he would dismiss, disregard, and disrespect. He would dismiss your agenda. He would dismiss your excuses. And he will dismiss your schedule. If you want purpose, if you want more of him, get ready for your agenda to change. If you want the presence of the Lord is here, get ready for your schedule to change. If you want God everywhere I go, I want him around me, everywhere I go, God, God, God blesses everywhere so fast my head will spin. Get ready for your excuses to be eliminated. <laughs> the first thing, that pur the purpose of God will always disregard your agenda. We want the purpose of God to fit in our schedule. People want the assignment of God and the anointing of God to come with an agenda, reveal the agenda. We want God's promises to reveal the plan. But the promises of God, the power of God, they don't come with an agenda. They come with an assignment. Write this down. What annoyed people call problems, anointed people call assignments. Until you stop seeing problems in your life and ask yourself, why has God not eliminated them yet? Why won't God just take it away from me? The reason why he's not taking it away from you, because it's a sign to you for you to defeat it. And until you stop calling on God and start looking at you, 
No one could go to the cross but Jesus. No one can build this rock upon this church like Peter. You have to eventually step into your life. Everybody in the Bible at first, they might have been following Jesus. They might have been following God. But eventually they had to start stepping into their life. They had to start stepping. I know you love the Lord, but when are you going to love the way God loves you? You got to step into your life. And if you don't step into your life, you will always forfeit, a, you will always forfeit an assignment because you think it's a problem. And you'll miss out on your promotion because you're living a demoted IQ life. Everything you do is to avoid problems. You don't like traffic. You don't like lines. You don't like meetings. You don't like personalities. And God's like, I got to use a meeting to bless you. I got to use people to bless you. I got to get you in the car to bless you. You don't like flying. I don't like trains. First class, not that comfortable. God's like, well, what can I do with you in the earth? Because everything annoys you. I'm not allowed to be God in your life because you want yourself to plan everything. I don't like water. Okay. <laughs> the purpose plot is the twist of your life. It's the thought I was going this way, but now I'm going that way. Nehemiah the cupbearer had an agenda every day. His job was to pour the drink, go to the king, and do his job. Pour the drink, go to the king, do his job. Pour his drink, drink the taste, do his job, right? But then when his boy says, yo, Nehemiah, let me tell you what's happening. Nehemiah chapter 1, 1 to 12, it's going to happen during the month of Chislev in, in the 20th year, the Persian king, Hanai, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came. And Nehemiah 1, 1 through verse 2, he says, listen, let me tell you what's happening in your hometown, Nehemiah. Nehemiah kept doing his job as a cupbearer. He said, listen, the Jews are in captivity there. And not only that, the walls of the city have been destroyed. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 2. And this day, for the first time on his agenda, for the first time on his agenda, his agenda every day was consistent. It was comfortable. It was regular. I mean, yeah, my people are in captive, but I got the most bougiest job. I'm a cupbearer in the palace. I'm not in the field. I'm in the house. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I, got, I'm, I got the royal tire because, you know, all the cupbearers had to look a certain way. And he feels everything's good, you know? Everything's good until it happens to your hometown. So <laughs> that has nothing to do with the message. So it happened to his hometown. And what immediately happens? For the first day ever, what's on his agenda, if you can leave it up for me, media, for the first time on his agenda, now grief is there. He's crying, oh, my God, my people. Oh, my people are in captive. Man, they're in captivity. Oh, in the legacy of my city, the walls of Jerusalem, which represents the God who fortifies us. It represents our great Jehovah. They done broke that thing down. They done tore it to smithereens. Our dignity is gone. Oh, my God. And he cries out to God. And Nehemiah is hit with a twist in his agenda. Because the purpose of God on his life is not for him to stay a comfortable cupbearer. It's not. So uh, uh, he could think it's the devil. It's the devil antagonizing my life, updating me with what's going on in my hometown. No, it's not. It's God allowing you to get an update so you can find purpose. See, it wasn't time for Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of his ancestors. It was actually time for him to be a cupbearer until the plot twist shows up. And now his servants and all these people, he said, now, Lord, be with me, be with me, be with my tongue. Give me the tongue of the learned. As I talk to the king Xerxes of Persia, he goes to talk to the king. He tells the king exactly what he needs. He communicates in a way of leadership and strategy. And this is a cupbearer speaking eloquently. All these things in his life that he never had to say. He never had to have permission to do, a, do, to do an exploit. But, so what if he was scared? Let's talk, church. What if he was scared to start his construction company? What if he was scared? What if he said, I couldn't do it? You know, everything Nehemiah needed in him for that great job was in him feeling awkward. I'm going to talk to someone in here. It was in him feeling uncertain, and it was in his tears and his weeping. Matter of fact, the worst day of his life activated the prophetic gifts called to his assignment. I need you to catch this. He is grieving, and as he's grieving, he's asking God to hear his prayers. And then while he's asking God to hear his prayers, he realizes nobody's coming. I'm the one. 
while he's on his knees wishing a superhero will come save his people, he realizes my aunt ain't going to be rich. My dad left me. He ain't show up at the football games. I have the opportunity to show up for my kids. You have to see you're looking for somebody to save you, but it's time for you to do the saving. Nehemiah stepped up and stepped in. Look at your neighbor and say, step up and step in. 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 Ask somebody, are you annoyed or anointed this week? The second thing God will dismiss you with his purpose plot, he's going to dismiss your excuses. He's going to disregard your excuses and dismiss your excuses. Look to your neighbor and say, what's your excuse? We all have excuses. We all have them, but they don't work with God. They might work with your supervisor. They might work with an email, but they don't work with God. Excuses do not work with God. It will work when you text your leader. It really don't, but it doesn't work with God. In fact, all excuses do is verify why God chose you. The more excuses you have, God says, thank you for showing me how weak you are. That's more strength coming to you. Well, God, I come from a broken family. Thank you for telling me you have a broken family. That's more wholeness coming to you. Well, God, I don't know if I have enough time to do that. Thank you for telling me you don't have enough time. I'm going to create time in your schedule. We'll take care of that. You're fired next week. (laughs) Don't play with God. No, I'm for real now. Well, God, I'm too busy. Oh, you're busy. Here's some COVID-19 for you. (laughs) Now you're quarantined enough to write the book. Let's talk. I wrote my whole book when I had the virus. Should have been wrote it. God will eliminate your excuses the more you give them. So look at your name and say, stop playing with God. There's some great men and women in the Bible, and they all came with excuses. Now, that's what blessed me, because I thought I had to come with confidence with God to use me. They all came with excuses. Everybody you can name in the Bible came with excuse. And Judges, Gideon came with excuse. His excuse in Judges chapter 6, 14 through verse 16, the Lord himself turned to him and said, you have the strength. Deliver Israel from God, the Midianites. I have not, have I not sent you? Gideon was wondering, why are you asking me to do something right now? Like, I'm minding my own business, dude. Like, I'm out here chilling. I'm out here working. I'm just out here being Hebrew, man. And here comes God, great man with valor. See, aren't you so glad? You really need to give God a praise right now for not running up on you like he used to run up on people in the Bible. He used to be tickling your spirit at night. Oh, God. Like, God just be, he's so nice to us today. Back in those days, he would run up on you and be like, boom, Minister Gretchen, let's go. God now is like, hey, you know, you should do that. You should buy the house. You should. No, God, I can't. You just chill with God. You could be, listen, th- because of what Jesus did on the cross, you could be in complete disobedience, completely out of the will of God, and comfortable at the same time. I'm telling you, man, but back in those days, God would run up on you, minding your own business, and now your whole life had to change. Someone say purpose plot. Purpose so Gideon came up with another excuse. He said in verse 15, but Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Just look, man, my clan is the weakest. I'm a weakling. I'm the, it's the weakest in Mesla. I'm the youngest in my family. I'm young. The Lord said to him, ah, look at that. It says, ah, you see that? Put it up there. I want to see that. Ah, look, look, look. No, it didn't say, okay. Mine says, ah, but I will be with you. You will strike down the whole Midianite army. See, your excuses are the errors that Satan tries to make bigger than God. Your excuses are designed for Satan to fill it. Your faith is designed for God to fill it. The bigger your excuse, the bigger your devil will be. The bigger you're wondering what God can do in your life, the bigger God would be. Some of us, our excuses are finances. Some of us, our excuses are family. Some of us, our excuses are bloodline. Some of us, our excuses are pedigree, like Moses. Moses said, now listen, I'm not educated enough to go talk to Pharaoh. I have a stuttering issue. I don't don't have a communication gift, God. You cannot use me to deliver your people. I'm over here keeping these sheep, and I used to be a murderer. Now, God, if I go back there, they're going to take me. They're going to take me captive. I killed a soldier. I did, I'm not, and the burning bush. I, I looked at this scripture and it really messed me up. First of all, Moses didn't ask for no burning bush. The burning bush asked for him. And then the first thing the burning bu- bush does is correct Moses. He said, take off your shoes. The ground is holy. What? what? Like, so now Moses is barefoot in a problem. 
ain't nothing like being barefoot in a problem. He is barefoot, corns on his feet, but anointed for his next assignment. Look at your feet and say, I don't care how ugly they are. You're called to something beautiful. Gideon's excuse was his family. Moses' excuse was his pedigree. Moses' excuse was his education. In Exodus 4, verse 10, his excuse was his education. But Moses said to the Lord, I am not a man of words. I'm not eloquent enough to deal with an emperor. I'm not eloquent enough to deal with a prime minister. Neither before nor since you have spoken. But here's what blesses me with what God said. God says, you're worried about education, but you're not worried about who created communication. God said, you worry about what you say. I'm worried about your, I will redesign your mouth. Some of you all have things going on in your body and your health, and you think your health is an excuse why you, God said, I will heal your body. I will get you up. So if you're believing God for healing, give God a praise right now. God will heal your body. He will give you words to say that you never knew you could say because you're called to communicate the word of God. God will give you the ability to go out there and pursue things that you know that you thought you could not pursue. God will give you the mental toughness that you need to do business at the level God's calling you to. Don't disrespect and disregard and count God out because you think you don't have the pedigree for the promises of God. It's the purpose plot. Moses would have one excuse after another. It was here that each excuse was met with revelatory rebuttal. God would not change his mind. God said, I'm still sending you. I'm sending you broken. I'm sending you wondering if you're able. I'm sending you, I'm sending you questioning yourself. I'm sending you to start it without money. I'm sending you while things aren't right in your life yet. I'm still sending you. I'm not waiting no more for you to get yourself together. You've been trying to get yourself together and do what I'm supposed to tell you to do for too many years now. Somebody in here, God's saying this, I'm about to send a plot to your life. I'm going to bump you right into my plan so you can be a blessing to people you're called to be blessed for, blessed to. Someone say, uh oh, there goes my schedule. <laughs> Esther's purpose wasn't on her schedule. Esther knew what time it was. She was battling if she was meant, if she was called to be queen. She, but that's why Mordecai prophetically says to her, that's why you gotta keep prophetic voices in your life. Because what a prophetic voice would do is it will remind you of what time it is when you think it's not time. Esther's wondering if she has the ability to do the job that she, she has been given. She's wondering, and Mordecai says, what if you were a queen at such a time as this? What if you were created queen for such a time as this? Esther was battling with her schedule. She was wondering if she had the ability to do what she was called to do. But God, tell, God sends Mordecai into her life, and God tells her, do not get so comfortable. In Esther chapter 4, verse 9 through verse 11, it talks about scheduling. It talks about things. And so Esther says, okay, I will do what Mordecai told me to do. Just pray with me and fast for three days. And she says, Mordecai, now listen, what you're asking me to do does not line up with my schedule. She, so all the king's officials and people of royal provinces know for, that any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned... You are not allowed to come to the king unless it was on his schedule. Will be put to death unless the king extends his gold scepter. So he said, look, let me tell my uncle that. Listen, I know you want me to go tell this king this, but I'm not on his schedule this week. It's not on my schedule this month to start the business. It's not on my schedule this year to get the job done. It's not on my schedule this year to go ahead and propose to the girl you've been dating for five years and he already told you that's your wife. Lord, I'm messing people's Christmas up. <laughs> Esther, it looks like your purpose looks like it's not fitting your schedule. Esther, it's not the devil attacking you to make you feel that tossing and turning at night. It's not the devil that's trying to mess your schedule up. It's purpose calling your name, Esther. It's purpose calling you forth. It's to rise up. And protect God's people from a dictator. It's, it's purpose. And Esther 4 and 14, we're going to close here. For if you remain silent at this time, liberation and rescue will arise for the Jews from another place. And you and your father's house will perish since you did not help when you had the chance. Yes, yeah, there. And who knows whether you have attained royalty for such a time as this. And for this very what? purpose. God sends a purpose plot to your life. Look to your neighbor and say, hear God about how long you should work there. Woo! You're going to get answers on this Sunday.
New Living Translation says, who knows? If perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. What if you're in service? What if you're serving the community at a leadership position for such a time as this? Your on time can be considered late before God, and your late could be considered on time with God. Obedience does not come with daytime and nighttime hours. There's no a.m. or p.m. with obedience. Obedience is only loyal to purpose. What if all the hell you're going through is a portal for heaven to have its way with your life? What if those triggers of trauma in your life are motivators for becoming the powerful person you're called to be? You wanted comfort. God gave you conviction. You wanted a schedule. God gave you changes. You wanted promotion. God gave you challenges. You wanted favor. God caused everybody not to like you. There's always a twist with purpose. Don't ask God for one breaded peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It comes with two sides of the bread. I have never seen someone eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with one piece of bread. Here's the conclusion. I want you to receive the purpose plot for your life and stop dissing God. Because you don't understand how God can use you. You have no excuse. Step into your life. You prayed long enough. I feel like I'm talking to somebody. You cried long enough, yo. You know, you're already educated. See, some of you all got the degree and still ain't do it. Because you thought it would be the degree that would cause you to do it. It wasn't the degree, it was the faith. And now you're back to the same place you feel. Uncertainty. You thought the degree would make you certain. You thought the title will make you certain. If I could just be a mother, it'll make me certain. No, it get created more confusion. The purpose of God comes with plots. It comes with twists. And your faithfulness is about how you steward when things are out of control. Everyone standing, please. Come on, give God a praise right now. We will find good success when we become better stewards of the plot twists of our life. We got to be able to keep our wits and keep our mind when things are out of control in God's plan. God, I come to you right now. And you know I was preaching to myself. I pray right now for your people that they will begin to understand the difference between the tossing and turnings that come from you and the tearing and ripping that comes from the devil. Holy Spirit, help us not continue to be disobedient to the exploits you're giving us to do. Lord, we've been faithful at showing up for everybody else. Woo! But when will we show up for ourselves? God, you place something in our spirit, not our mind. That's why our mind second guesses what you can do. We repent, Lord, for trying to have our lives figured out. We run back to you, Daddy. Woo. Reset our schedule. We give you back our agenda so you can have your way with us, God. We admit, God, we need help. I heard you, God. Some of us, when was the last time you admitted you just need help? God, we take off pride and we put on uncertainty. Because at least if we're uncertain, God, we can find faith again. And I pray that your liberating power that I know is inside this building will resonate and send wind to somebody's cell to do the very thing that they're called to do. Because while you're celebrating others, God's patiently waiting to celebrate you. But if you won't step into you, if you won't show up for you, you'll never know what God can do in you.